Hello everyone, my name is Sean Lewis and I want to welcome you to Primary Waves Wave Makers and Music Series, formerly known as Industry Hour. Today we have a discussion with Profit from the Black Music Action Coalition and Congressman Jamal Bowman discussing the Rap Act, as well as a one-on-one -on -one interview with myself and Profit from BMAC discussing everything that BMAC's been up to since its 2020 inception. First of all, I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, I am Profit, the co-founder, co-chair of the Black Music Action Coalition. For those who don't know, the Black Music Action Coalition formed uh, in 2020 in response to the music industry's uh, stopping the show and pausing the show. Um, it was the greatest call for racial justice this nation ever experienced. And the music industry knew we had a role to play in that music being the universal language and having the power to heal and transform. And we knew that we had to activate the music industry community, not just around fighting systemic racism within the music industry, but also using that collective influence to impact broader society. And um, one of the things that we understood clearly is that if we don't change policy, nothing changes here. No matter how angry we get, no matter how upset or how frustrated or how right we are, if we don't have policy to back it, it goes nowhere. We have to change the protest to policy. And so for BMAC, it was imperative that we put our foot in that race and began to, to, to deal with legislation uh, on a federal and local level. And one of the things that we want to address uh, early on, Dina LePoe, uh, attorney, uh, who's also a board member, one of the co-founders of SONA, Songwriters of North America. Uh, she's also on the Executive Leadership Council uh, of, of the Black Music Action Coalition. She got a call from Shirley from Variety Magazine, and, and this was uh, late 2020. And on that call, Shirley began to speak to her about the cases um, that was going on around the country in which artists, well, black men were being locked up uh, and prosecuted uh, with no other physical evidence, no other evidence uh, outside of lyrics and knew that there was something that needed to be done. So uh, the Black Music Action Coalition, along with the Music Artists Coalition and Songwriters of North America, led a working group to develop the federal legislation that would address this on a federal level. And I had the pleasure through a good friend of mine, uh, Tuma Bassa, uh, who's the head of black music at YouTube, to meet this brother, uh, who is the congressman of the 16th district, uh, brother Congressman Jamal Bowman. And um, I, I thank you for, for being here, and I thank you for being a warrior out here, a fighter for our people, and a fighter for hip hop. You know, and, 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 and we're going to get into a little bit of that today. But, but first and foremost, uh, tell the people a little bit about yourself, your journey, and, and what led you to politics. Of course, of course. First of all, peace and love, brother. Absolutely. It's great to, great to be here with you. And, and thank you, first and foremost, for, for your love uh, and your leadership and your work on this particular piece of legislation. Uh, and thank you for all the work you do. Uh, it's, it's, it's needed. Uh, it's mandatory that everyone has to get engaged and get involved. So, so thank you for that. Um, so my background is education. Um, I worked in education for, for 20 years, uh, started my career as an elementary school teacher in the South Bronx, did that for about five or six years. What school in the South Bronx? Um, PS90 in okay. the South Bronx, off of 166 in Sheridan Avenue. Absolutely. Right off the Grand Concourse, right across the street from... Uh, a huge uh, DJ Cool Herc mural mm. connected to that that large mansion that's there on the on the Grand Concourse. So I was there as a teacher for about five or six years before becoming a high school uh, guidance counselor and dean of students. And just from the very beginning, when I worked in education, uh, hip hop was a part of my curriculum. And the reason why it was a part of my curriculum is because it taught me so much as mm, a kid growing up. Absolutely. Hip hop gave me more knowledge of self than the school curriculum ever did. And so for me to begin teaching in the South Bronx, I wanted to incorporate KRS-One, Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, X-Clan, Brand Newbie into my curriculum. 
So started working as a guidance counselor, dean of students, and realized that uh, the education system wasn't doing a, enough to unlock the brilliance of our kids. Mm. So I had the opportunity to, to write a proposal and open up my own uh, public school in the Northeast Bronx, a public school, not a charter school. And I worked there for 10 and a half years as a, as a middle school principal, and we, we, we did incredible work there. And then I decided, you know what? Uh, I, I think I have a voice and a, and a vision that could be very helpful to the larger districts. So I ran for Congress in 2020. Uh, no one thought I would have a chance to, to to win that race, and we didn't just win. You know, we crushed it. We, we won by 16 points against a 31 year incumbent. And the reason why I ran first and foremost was because of my kids, man, my students. I saw how they was hurting and struggling and suffering with challenges with housing and mental health and lack of fully funded schools and green spaces and jobs and, and, and opportunities, but overall because of social and racial injustice. Right. Um, and, and hip hop obviously talks a lot about that and is aligned to that. So um, that's my district, that's my background, and, and, and it's just a blessing and very humbling to be in Congress doing this work. That's incredible. You know, um, this is the 50th anniversary of yes. hip hop. Hip hop turned 50 years old this year. Um, an art form that the world um, didn't understand in the beginning, didn't believe would be around, uh, but now uh, it's a trillion dollar industry. It is what keeps most lights on in, in corporations across the globe, impacts bottom lines all over the place. And now it kind of feels that the culture is under attack. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your reason for getting involved with the rap act yeah. um, from that perspective? No, so I also just want to add, hip hop also brings people together. There you go. So the same way the civil rights movement brought people together to fight for federal policy around okay. issues of racial justice and economic justice, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Black the Black Panther, Black Power Movement, uh, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement, the US Organization, Fred Hampton, like that was the Civil Rights Movement. Hip hop via the you know the, the Dead Poets and others is the evolution of that. Sure, and it really brings people together, you know. And as I mentioned before, hip hop was a not just a curriculum for my life, but a lifeline. Mm. It gave me identity and knowledge of self that I wasn't getting in the schools, I wasn't getting on TV, wasn't getting on mainstream media. And it's not just me, it's given millions. Right. <laughs> if, right. Not, if not billions of not just black people, people, young people, people who struggle, people who come from oppressive, challenging circumstances, it's given them voice and knowledge of self. Um, so it's had a, it's had a tremendous impact, and now to see it well, it's always been under attack. Let's mm -hmm. be clear, right? Sure. So from from NWA receiving a, a a letter from the FBI because of their song "F the Police," to the Two Live Crew, uh, on and on and on, it's always been under attack. As if other other genres aren't raunchy and 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 violent and what have you, always been under attack. But what we've seen, what we've seen over the last several years, is an exponential growth mm -hmm. of prosecutors specifically using hip hop lyrics to target hip hop artists who are mostly black men. And we have right now, as you know, right now, there are individuals doing life in prison, right, only because of the hip hop lyrics that they that they wrote as part of their art form, right. No other forensic evidence, witness testimony, hard evidence, weapon, no other information. Right. And in state by state across this country and county by county, it is being allowed because the perception of hip hop artists, because they are black men, is that they are criminal. Now, when you compare that to country music, mm -hmm. heavy metal music, Rock and roll, where again, it's an art form, it's lyrics, people are writing about all kind of stuff. We've seen hip hop targeted in well over 500 cases nationally over the last decade. We've seen other genres of music combined target two, three times. Right. And and each time, it, all the, in terms of the times they were targeted, those cases were either dismissed or thrown out. Whereas hip hop, we got people in prison right now. Absolutely. So, 
Shout out to California because California has responded with legislation to stop this from happening in California. Yeah, uh, we definitely work, we definitely yeah. got to give Governor Newsom some props. And and really, we have to give props to Assemblyman uh, uh, Joan Sawyer, mm-hmm. who, who who led that that legislation and really rallied and got the artist community to get behind uh, that bill that Newsom signed. So salute to them. But, but to, yeah, but to no, your point. No, absolutely. So shout out to California for being a leader yes. on this. We know that there's leadership in New York State as well. It hasn't become law yet, but it's being pushed. But we need federal legislation. Absolutely. And we need legislation at every level of government, federal, state, county, local. And our bill, the bill that you you all led on that we support, is the RAP Act, the Restoring Artist Protection Act. So let's, let's unpack that, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what the RAP Act is, yes. right? Um, people say, well, if they rap about it, they should they should go to jail. If they, if they commit a crime and they rap about it, they should go to jail. Let me just say, yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> if you committed a crime, and you rapped about it, you should go to prison. Let that let the record reflect profit. <laughs> it, that's my point. However, we have to get to the point of guilt. We have to have a trial, and then we have to get to a point where someone is then found guilty. And evidence outside and then of that yeah. guilt need to come <laughs> yeah. by way of evidence that's pointing to that crime being committed. Whether it's physical evidence, forensic evidence that yeah. you spoke to, whether yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, witness testimony, whether it's something else yeah. outside of a song that was created mm-hmm. in which you don't know who was in the studio at the time making the song. You don't know what the inspiration was. You don't know what that person was pulling from. But this is the end product. So please let's unpack this yeah. restoring artistic protection act in a way that people can completely understand what our four pillars are and the points that we are trying to make by even pr- uh, proposing this legislation yes and the key word is artistic protection rap is an art form MCing is an art form right so like like literature literature has uh components of it that make it literature personification, metaphor, simile, storytelling, foreshadowing. This is all part of art. It's all part of literature. Back to a point you made before. Prosecutors aren't doing the same thing with other genres of music. They're just not. So, you know, rock and roll, heavy metal, country music. I sent you a song the other day from a country, uh, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. No, country listen, music, listen. I don't know if people know this. I'm going to say this directly into the camera. So country- Kelsey Ballerini. What was what it? Kelsey Ballerini. Kelsey Ballerini. Shout out to Kelsey Ballerini. <laughs> this is a dope if song. If you're going down, I'm going down too. If you going down, I'm going down too. She <laughs> writes a song about- Yeah. If some, one of her friends or people or partners commits a murder- Yes. She ain't snitching. Right. She going to come over. She going to help clean up the crime scene, get rid of the body, and do whatever needs to be done so her pers- her partner don't get caught. Right. And she going to be culpable in helping them not get caught. Right. This is a song. It's a great song. It's very creative. It's very innovative. I sent it to you because I'm like, are prosecutors banging down her door right. and charging her with criminal conspiracy? Right. No, because everyone recognizes it. When it comes from non-black people, non-brown people, mostly white people, right. that is just art form, right? right? So so it doesn't happen in other genres of music, but Absolutely. it happens in rap because you know most rap artists are, are black people. And again, to double click on what you said, someone commits a crime, they need to be held accountable. If someone commits a crime and is stupid enough to rap about it, we would assume that there's other evidence to support Absolutely. you pursuing prosecution. And then if you wanted to use lyrics on the back end to support right. that, cool. Which this is bill, what which is what the bill suggests. That's right. And the bill says this yes. clearly. You can read the bill and it says this clearly. What we're saying is don't just come and say, oh, you said this in your lyrics. I ain't got no other evidence. I ain't got no witnesses. I got no corroborators. But we going to prosecute you and, you know, convene a, a grand jury because of these lyrics. Right. That should not be happening. Right. And, and, and that's the part that I think people really need to be clear on. We, we said in this bill 
yes, lyrics can be used to support yes. additional evidence. And that needs to be presented to a judge prior to it being presented to a jury. And if you deem it, and if there's enough evidence, then move forward. We're not saying that the lyrics should be omitted completely. We're Correct. saying this should not and cannot be the only thing that you are using mm -hmm. to prosecute. So let me ask you this question. Where are we at right now with the bill? What, what do we need for it to go to the next level? Um, you know, let's speak to that a little bit. So we introduced a bill uh, during the second half of last year, uh, during the 117th Congress. Um, so the bill has, I believe the number is 20 or 30 co-sponsors. I could be wrong with the number. Um, and because we weren't able to move it through the House or, or move it through the Senate or get it to the president's desk for legislation, um, it needs, uh, we have to reintroduce it because we have a new Congress that was sworn in on January 6th. So we're going to reintroduce the bill. What's really important is for us to get as many other congressional co-sponsors as possible, which we'll, we'll do the work inside the House to do that. What's gonna be really important for the public to help us with is to contact your member of Congress and, and tell your member of Congress that this bill is important to you and you want them to support this bill. Whether it's Democrat or Republican, this should be a bipartisan bill that is supported because it also gets at the issue of free speech. We need a Senate lead for the bill. Right now, we do not have a Senate lead. When you have a Senate lead, it's more likely to move the boat through both houses at the same time, get the support and get to the president's desk. And you know, before I go further, huge shout out to uh, Congressman Hank Johnson from Atlanta uh, for allowing me to be a part of this bill and being an original uh, co-author with him on this bill. Um, so we got New York, we got Atlanta. Obviously, we're going to have California reps support it, right? Um, but we need everyone to support this because we do not, if we allow free speech to be attacked, if we allow our art to be attacked, we cease to exist as a democracy and we right. now move towards a country that is fascist in nature. We, we clear about the need for diversity, we clear about the need for inclusion, and we clear about the fact that this is a 400 year plus issue for black America. Um, what are some of the other things you're working on um, in your office in addition to the RAP Act to bring about equality? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that question and I, I just wanna just, Everything you just said um, was 100% accurate and spot on. Um, if we allow our art to be attacked as a country, uh, we, we lose our humanity as a nation mm. because art is an expression of our humanity. Mm. Uh, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, it's, it's the voice of, 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 of this country and it captures our history, it captures our pain, it captures our our joy, it captures our dreams. Um, and it, the thing about hip hop, you know, we got to understand the political context in which it was born, yeah. right? This was a, this was an American economy that was going through decay, especially the Bronx. Um, you know, landlords were burning buildings for insurance money. Uh, kids were left neglected in the streets to fend for themselves. And those same kids decided to, uh, stop killing each other, stop fighting each other, and instead compete through the arts, which was graffiti MC and DJ and break dancing. And break dancing, right? So, uh, you know, just, just to give that context. So we in Congress, through legislation and, do it through, and through our advocacy, we're doing a lot of work around criminal justice reform, and this is connected to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a prison industrial complex right. that continues to exist through the targeting of poor people and poor people of color in particular. You know, we uh, incarcerate way more people than any other developed nation in the world. And the, and the numbers and the people we incarcerate are disproportionately black and brown. So part of our criminal just, justice reform work is, is focused on the, the understanding that we do a terrible job at healing, at restorative justice, at nurturing health and well-being. Um, and, and instead, what we see is the constant recidivism. Ooh. People in and out of jail, in and out of jail, in and out of jail, 
for minor crimes or because they can't afford bail or whatever the case may be. So we are focused on legislation and advocacy to support anybody who's been criminal justice entangled. If you're 13, 14, 15, you've been arrested by the cops, there's a small thing, sent you back home. We wanna bring resources to that child and that family to make sure that child doesn't get arrested again. If you've done years in prison and you come home and you're gonna struggle with finding housing and, and employment and, uh, and, and education opportunities because of how you're marginalized and disenfranchised, even as an ex uh, person who's incarcerated, we provide support with helping people with housing, helping formerly incarcerated people with jobs, awesome. helping with that education. Um, so it's, it's legislation, but it's also advocacy and resources. So we partner with organizations like, there's an organization called Hope in my district that provides workforce development for formerly incarcerated people. Greystone in my district in Yonkers, formerly incarcerated people, they provide support with, with jobs and with housing as well. So we do a lot of that. We also do a lot of work in education, obviously. We have a piece of legislation called the Green New Deal for Public Schools, which, which evolves our education system into the 20th, 21st century, focused on science, technology, and environmental justice, mm. making our schools green spaces for learning and growth and development, investing in red line communities, which mm. are the same communities that produce hip hop because of historical neglect. That's right. But let's finally invest there to create pipelines to education and pipelines to the science and technology jobs of the 21st century. So that's some of the stuff we're doing, but we're doing a lot more around workers' rights, wealth inequality, reparations. We're going to have a huge reparations bill coming this Congress. So a lot of exciting work, but none of it matters if we don't have the public working with our office, but working with their members of Congress, pushing them to support legislation that's righteous and justice and focuses on the issue of equality. That's awesome, bro. Uh, salute to you. And I love the idea of mixing the legislative process with the advocacy and, and, and resources. Because it's one thing to, to, to be in DC, you know, banging down the doors, you know, for policy work. Uh, it's another thing, those day-to-day -day needs of the, of, of the, of the community. Uh, so to be able to meet and, and play both of those, uh, that's awesome, man. So s salute to you. Let, 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 let me ask you this question. When did you fall in love with hip hop? And which song was it that 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 gave you your first yeah. idea that this this spoke to your spirit? Damn, I I thought I can't remember the exact date. <laughs> um, but the song was uh The Show by Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. Okay. So uh, I'm young. I'm so hip hop's 50 this year. I'm turning 47 this year. I'm born in 76. I think the show was, I'm gonna mess up the day. I don't even wanna to try to, to get it right. <laughs> um, but the show, when I heard it on the radio, I was just, I was just almost like transfixed into another universe. Mm. You know what I mean? And uh, and that that started my journey, man. From there was the uh it was the Fat Boys. Uh, it was it was it was Run DMC. Uh, it was uh, Eric B and Rakim paid in full. So let's take it back real quick. Eric B and Rakim paid in full. All right, set the scene for me. Where you at? What, what's going on? What yeah. you got on? Like paint the paint the picture for me. What's happening? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm in and I'm still young. I mean, this came out '87. Mm -hmm. So I'm 11. I'm, okay, I'm a okay, young okay, kid. okay, 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 yeah. like, okay. Like, you, you ain't on the block yet. No, I'm not on okay. the block yet. I'm, I'm playing tag <laughs> yeah. and Ray yeah, yeah. Lario and <laughs> that stuff, right? But um, I'm in my apartment with my sister's boyfriend, mm -hmm. who, who was who was five percent. Okay. Um, and um, and my father wasn't around, so he was like my my everything, role mm. model, uncle, whatever. His name was Yasin, and um, I go for a ride one day with him and he's playing the paid in full album in the car. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm even now when I hear Rakim, I'm like, yo, Rakim's not from earth. Yeah. Right. Like, right. He's, he's, <laughs> like he's, he's, his yeah. voice, what he was saying, it, it just sounded alien to me. It was like, this guy's an alien. He's, mm -hmm. he's from another planet. Um, and I was into like cartoons, mm -hmm. 
uh, and Star Wars and all that at that time. So it was like an extension of that. It was the same almost spiritual response or reaction or emotion. Rakim's voice on Paid in Full and and uh, and and Transformer cartoons and, and Marvel comic yeah. books yeah. and Star Wars. And the song that got me at that time was Move the Crowd off the Paid in Full album. And the line that literally is dictated probably my whole life, especially my life in education, when he says, with, with knowledge of self, there's nothing I can't solve. It's 360 degrees I revolve. Ooh. It's an actual fact. It's not an act. It's improvement. Indeed, and I could proceed to make the crowd keep moving. Yeah. Those bars, right? That that's like that was the foundation Classic. of pursuing knowledge of self. And then once I started pursuing knowledge of self and, and gained knowledge of, of self, you know, I, that's how I've been able to deal with white supremacist political and economic Come on, system doctor. in America. You know, the craziest thing I asked you that question because I think with all of the attention that hip hop has been giving over the past couple of years, and particularly with some of the violence and mm -hmm. things that have been associated with the culture, you people don't realize or tend to forget what that or what the culture means mm -hmm. to people. You know, what those songs, what those artists represented in the moments that, that those records help you get through, right? Mm -hmm. The times that those songs help you understand. And I love the fact that you was able to almost humanize rap in, in, in a way where you, when you're able to talk about being in that, that, that house and, and what that lyric did for you, how you a congressman. Yeah, because of that lyric. That lyric yeah. set, set forth to the trajectory of your life that you live by, and that came from the 13th letter. That's right. You know, that's what the culture is to us. Yeah. So I thank you, brother, for, 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 for showing the world is bigger than that, not just in conversation, but in actual movement. Uh, you're living by it. Um, you are, you know, it's clear that you have a bright, bright future um, as it relates to politics. Uh, we need warriors uh, in those halls shaking it up and bringing a perspective that is real. Um, we, we thank you for joining the Rap Act and, and, and leading it in, in the way that you're doing. You and Congressman Hank Johnson are doing an incredible job. Um, this is definitely one of the biggest conversations of 2022. Um, and, and I look forward to the fight in 23. Let's get this thing over the, over awesome. the hump. Let's bring in the co-sponsors. Let's bring in the Senate partner. And, um, and, and let's get this one off the book so that we can move to the next piece of legislation. Uh, thank you, my brother. Thank you, man. And, uh, and look you. forward to continuing uh, to, to, to the bill with you, man. Continue work together. Appreciate Salute. it. Thanks for having me. All right. So we're here today with Profit from BMAC, the Black Music Action Coalition. And we're really interested in learning more about him and his origin story. So, Prophet, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got involved with the music industry and activism in general. Well, um, I got involved with activism when I was around 13 years old. Um, I got into an altercation with the police officers in the, in the, in the projects that I was living in, Melrose Project in the South Bronx. And um, they had uh, refractured my clavicle, and uh, it was already fractured. And then through the physical altercation I had with them, it, it got refractured. And my mother, who who um, who was extremely pro-black, you know, like like she she taught us a sense of pride um, about our culture from the moment I can remember. And so uh, they, they had a rally in the projects and, um, and they gave me the mic to speak. And I remember being so embarrassed. I said, I don't want to speak. You know, they got all these cameras here, these people here. And, you know, I just want to play basketball. You know, I, I wasn't trying to be an activist or anything. And, um, and they gave me the megaphone and I spoke. And I remember that moment. I remember something like, like coming over me, you know, as I was speaking and, and that kind of was the birth of my activism. And from there, I went on to, to uh, work with Reverend Sharpton and I developed his youth division for National Action Network called Youth Move. And, um, and then that led to 
entertainment and, 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 and things along those lines. But always, everything I got involved in uh, always was from an angle of, of fighting for justice and equality for our people and the culture. Cool, cool. Um, outside of that, which I assume was a pivotal moment for you in your development, and was there anything else that really led you towards activism, or would you say that that really was it? Yeah, you know, that that definitely led me to it. That was a, the uh, a, pivot, a pivotal moment as it relates to my activism. One of the things I also come to realize, you know, during that journey, uh, I met a woman named uh, Wendy Day. And she uh, ran an organization called the Rap Coalition. And they're basically, they're, their goal was to help artists get out of the fucked up deals, you know? And I felt very connected to that fight, you know? So even my entry point in music was from that angle of fighting for artists. So tell me about BMAC and how it all got started and, you know, what your mission is with BMAC. I got a call from Sean, Sean Holiday who said that him and Jeff Azoff and Damian Smith were calling a few friends each, and they wanted to get us all on the Zoom call to talk about what artists and managers can do um, beyond the, the, the Tuesday show, uh, pausing, but what we can really do to, to, uh, to impact true change in our own industry. Um, that, led, that call was about 30 people on that call, and then um, we decided that we should open up the conversation to a, a, a bigger and a broader audience. Um, so we invited a few more people to join the next Zoom, which turned out to be 150 people on that call. Uh, every music exec you can possibly name was, was on that call. And we realized at that moment that our industry um, was ready for a shift and that um, we have an opportunity here to 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 bust some of these glass ceilings open and to create more equity within this industry. So our mission is to do that. Our mission is to be obsolete, to be honest with you. You know, the goal of BMAC is to not have to have a BMAC uh, over the next, you know, several years. So we are looking to um for, for what was put in in in, in, in on Instagram and in post. We are looking for that to be put into actual reality, and 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 um, and we are going to hold our industry accountable to that. Makes sense. It it truly does. And I remember, you know, stopping the show, and everyone had their little black squares, and yeah. everyone thought, hey, "Well, what comes after this?" Right. Yes, I know. Me being a music industry professional myself, we were all talking about, "Okay, we made a black square on Instagram, but." What are we actually doing? Especially when you wake up Wednesday still black. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, so the show paused, but I still wake up black on Wednesday. So what are we really going to do to ensure that that this is not just performative and not just a moment, but we actually can create a movement from this? Yeah. Uh, in 2022, oh, BMAC's name was everywhere. So just give me the highlights. What have you guys done in, in 2022? And what are you guys looking to do in 2023? Uh, 2022 was a great year. Uh, one of our commitments um, and one of the pillars of BMAC is to make investments into the next generation of leaders. Um, we have to make sure that the next generation of Black executives are trained, are ready, and have the access that everyone else has. So we started off 2022 with a partnership with Audio Mac, and um, we reached out to five HBCU schools, and we uh, got five great students and uh, did an internship program uh, and, and, and mentorship program. That led us, and then we connected with Wasserman Music and the RIAA and YouTube and a great organization called Nashville Music Quality. And we um, did a program at Tennessee State University, a three-week program where we brought in over 30 industry professionals to come in and, and, and be guest lecturers for three weeks so it was a very, very powerful program. Uh, one of the things we also did uh, in 2022 is we released our report on country music. Uh, the report is called Three Chords and the Actual Truth. And we break down systemic racism in country music from the inception of the genre all the way up to a Morgan Wallen. Um, and, and then there was a call to action. Uh, when we released that report, we uh, asked for all of Music Row and all the companies uh, that operate in the country music space to ban the Confederate flag at all festivals and all shows. Uh, we also asked artists that own venues 
um, up and down Broadway to, to implement diversity policies, to allow black musicians to immediately begin p playing in those bars. So, you know, we, there was things that they can do to immediately start changing that narrative. And the third thing we asked um, was for them to support our uh, Guaranteed Basic Income Program, which I'm proud to announce um, that we formed a partnership with the ACM, the Academy of Country Music, and we're gonna be launching our first Guaranteed Basic Income Program in Nashville with them uh, this year in 2023. That's amazing. Um, and we're gonna be launching Guaranteed Basic Income Programs across the country this year. And basically it's direct income, it's direct cash relief to, to, to our people, but more importantly, wraparound services, everything from mentorship to financial empowerment. I'm really putting people in position to win. Um, and not just um, a Band-Aid, but actually really putting people um, in rooms that they normally wouldn't have access to and giving them the information that they normally wouldn't have access to so they can actually realize their dreams. You know, so um, we're really excited about that. Uh, one of the things that we're really proud about as well is that uh, we were able to partner with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis to create the Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis Music Maker Grant. And we gave $5,000 away uh, to a recipient, over over a thousand people uh, submitted, and uh, we now it down to about twenty. And then we uh, let Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis pick the final person, and we flew him to L.A., uh, gave him a check for five thousand dollars, and we're going to mentor that person for the next twelve months. Jam and Lewis is going to work with them. Um, but this is the type of investments that we're making into our community. You know, going beyond the performative shit, but really making true investments into the next generation of creators. Wow, that that's a lot. You guys really did a lot in 2022, and I can't wait to see what you guys are gonna do in 23. I'm sure it's a big year for you guys as well. Um, and next question I have is a music industry professional such as myself, a young one, and um, how can I be involved? How can other people be involved or organizations such as Primary Wave to help move this work forward? What can you do? Continue to stay in this fight. Continue to stay politically active. Um, the protest must turn into policy. So we don't take that energy and that frustration that we experienced in 2020 and make sure that we are applying that to the political process, we miss, right? So um, that's one of the things you can do. In terms of BMAC as an organization, uh, you know, our membership program opens up in 2023. Uh, we have a, a, a young cohort program that we're developing for young people. Um, a college outreach program where we're going to have youth representatives across the country uh, because this organization, although we, go, we are making changes within the music business, like the FAIR Act that we pushed and we fought for, um, the, the, uh, the RAP Act that we, uh, that we uh, de developed the federal legislation for, you know, as we move forward with all of those things in 2023, uh, we need the voices and the energy of young people to sustain that and to carry that mission out. Is there anything that we didn't touch on and about BMAC that you would like us to know or things that you're working on that you can give us some insight on? Yeah, two things I, 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 I would like to touch on. Three things. One, we have our, uh, our second music report card coming out. Uh, we launched our first one in 2021 where we graded the music industry in the matters of race and, and equity and inclusion. Our, our second report card comes out this year. Um, when we did the same and you're able to see whether or not it, companies uh, improved or whether or not they stayed true to their commitments or whether or not they, they, they went back on them. Um, so we, we detail that in, in the report. Uh, and I, like I said, our partnership with the American, with the Academy of Country Music, I'm excited about um, because you're talking about an opportunity to invest in, 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 in Black America in the country space in ways that hadn't been before. And another thing I'm excited about for this year, you know, our partnerships with Rolling Loud. Uh, so we'll be at the Rolling Loud festivals in, in New York and California and Miami, um, bringing the issues of racial and social justice straight to the generation that's going to bring about the change. So I'm excited about that uh, going into 2023. And um, we're working on a, uh, a uh, an executive training program where we're going to be able to uh, offer scholarships to executives to, to actually go and get training to be prepared for these roles. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, it's not just about inclusion. It's also about readiness and, and, and making sure that we're ready uh, to take on the responsibilities and the roles that, that we are seeking. And so we're going to make a real investment to making sure that the next generation of executives are ready uh, to lead, you know, in a major way. 
um, and also continue to put the pressure on. You know, uh, one of the things that we realize is that um, we, we we don't want to destroy the music business. You know, we 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 absolutely love the music industry. Music is 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 the greatest uh, one of the greatest cultural forces we have. Um, one of the greatest exports to come from this country is our culture musically. So we're not here to destroy it, but we're here to, to make this industry and country live up to its promise. Um, and, and we can have an industry of inclusion, an industry that's diverse, an industry that represents the consumer, right? We can absolutely have more black people in leadership positions. We can absolutely have more women in leadership positions and still have a thriving music industry. Um, and that's what we're pushing for. And one of the things I will say is I really want to give a shout out to our board. You know, uh, these are some of the most successful people in the music business, managing multi-million dollar operations, some of the biggest artists in the world. And I've watched them for the past three years dedicate themselves to building this organization and, and, and fighting for equality within the music industry. Um, and these are not traditional activists. You know, these are people who are running multi-million dollar businesses who, who understood that there was a bigger fight here. So salute to our board of directors, salute to our executive leadership council. We have over 30 people in our executive leadership council that represent about 60% of the music business. Uh, some of the most successful artists in the world uh, and some of the most successful uh, managers and lawyers in the world. And they are fighting for racial justice, you know? So I want to salute to, to them and, uh, and, and ask for them to stay encouraged, you know? But the goal of BMAC, as my co-chair Karen Vizi say, is to be obsolete. You know, the goal is to not have to have an organization like BMAC.